Okay. So we're going to in five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Charles County Public School Staff Town Hall. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. The Board of Education is committed to academically strong schools that are safe, respectful, and welcoming to all. Part of that commitment is hearing from our employees, parents, and community members about the issues that are important to you and your students. COVID-19 has presented challenges that caused us to close our school doors in March with very little notice. Hello. Little did we know that we would not reopen in the 2019-20 yes. school year. This afternoon, we are here to hear some of our thoughts and planning okay. for reopening our schools in the fall. And then the information you will hear today is tentative. Okay. How about now? Final decision will not be made until yeah, August here, when huh? the superintendent receives additional now? direction from the yes. state superintendent, yes. Dr. Karen Salmon. Although okay, the future is uncertain, but I can't, we continue I can't hear, to develop but I cannot multiple hear you guys. options I can't depending hear on the screen. situation in August. Yeah. The board in Charles County good. Public Schools are hosting the town halls to gather opinions and feedback on options to reopen schools. The board members hope you will freely share your ideas, concerns, and suggestions throughout this meeting. What you have to say is important to us. The presentations provided during the town hall include options suggested by five school system committees representing the following element, the following elementary, middle and high school levels, operations and health and safety. There are many ways to provide your comments to board members. Staff, parents and community members can provide comments for consideration by the board and Superintendent Hill by providing comments to the CCPS website at ccboe.com, calling the public comment voicemail line at 240-776-5803 and leaving a voice message. Staff will compile messages for review. And mailing comments to Charles County Public Schools at box 2770 La Plata, Maryland, 20646. The deadline to submit comments is Monday, July the 6th. Copies of the presentation to be shared at the town halls will be posted on the school system website at ccboe.com for your review. Charles County Public School staff are planning to present reopening options to the board in August. This afternoon is your opportunity to share your thoughts with the board and the superintendent. It is our opportunity to listen. I will now turn the meeting over to our panelists, Superintendent Dr. Kimberly A. Hill and Director of Safety and Security, Jason Stoddard. Dr. Hill. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mrs. McGraw and board members for uh, being with us today to hear from our staff. First, um, I'm going to go through a quick PowerPoint along with our Director of School Safety, Jason Stoddart. We'll be sharing uh, the slides that will be presented. And uh, Ms. Mackey, if you would pull those slides up for the public to see. I think it's important to understand that what Mrs. McGraw said and to reiterate what Mrs. McGraw said about these being tentative ideas. Uh, because everything that we do needs to align with what's going on at the state level. So next slide, please, Ms. Mackey. Before we really move forward, I want to take a look back. And these pictures are pictures of students learning at home, teachers teaching from home, graduates graduating in a very different way, building service teams, cleaning and sanitizing over 4 million square feet of space. Uh, we've served 350,000 meals to our to our community. We've created lessons. We've provided mental health supports. We've provided instruction. We've printed and delivered instructional packets. And I just want to thank you, our staff. Thank you for your agility, your flexibility, your positive attitude in working through these unprecedented conditions under which we're living. Next slide, please, Ms. Mackey. So looking forward, uh, we 
have several guiding principles that will help us make decisions about what school will look like in the fall. I know that many of you are hoping today that we're gonna give you a definite answer, and we just don't have those definite answers yet, but we do have some guiding principles that will help us make decisions as we move forward. The first and most important guiding principle is ensuring the health and safety of our staff, our students, and our community. So when we reopen schools, we're gonna do so in a way that is safe. We also wanna make sure that we have a continuity of learning that's aligned with state standards. We need to make sure when we come back to school that we're doing a good job of assessing where children are when they come back. And that's not just this fall, that's every fall. If you're a teacher listening to this presentation, you know that one of the first things that you do when you meet your students each year is that you get an understanding through assessment, formative and otherwise, of where they are, where their gaps are, what they already have a good understanding of, and that way you have, know what your starting point is. Another guiding principle is equity and access for all of our students. We worry deeply about those students who were unable to access instruction over these last 15 weeks. And so we're gonna make sure that we have a focus on those students and all of our students to make sure they are able to access instruction in the fall. Another guiding principle is supporting the emotional and mental health of staff and students. And then finally, making sure that we clearly and consistently communicate with our stakeholders. Next slide. It's important for our staff as well as our larger community to understand that opening schools and the decisions that are made right now are not local decisions. Our decisions, the decision to close schools was made by the state superintendent, Dr. Karen Salmon, uh, with the direction of Governor Larry Hogan. So what you see on your screen there are two documents that help us to make decisions. The Maryland Strong Roadmap Roadmap to Recovery is the governor's document about how to move Maryland safely through reopening its economy. And then the uh, Maryland Together, Maryland's Recovery Plan for Education is the document produced by the Maryland State Department of Education or MSDE. Both of those documents create some guardrails, if you will, for decisions made at the local level. I think it's also important to point out to our staff and to the public that when the governor is doing a press conference or the state superintendent is doing a press conference, uh, local jurisdictions, local superintendents do not have any advance notice of what is going to be talked about in that press conference. So literally we are, as our executive team, watching television and watching those press conferences, just like you are, uh, to learn what the next stage is for Maryland's reopening. Next slide. Mr. Stoddard, will you pick up from here? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jason Stoddard. I'm the Director of School Safety and Security for the Charles County Public Schools. Uh, it has been an honor to work with team members as uh, Dr. Hill put together early on in the, uh, at the end of, I believe it was May, um, we put together a, uh, a group for the, the April. Um, we put together a group of, uh, um, of five different teams uh, these teams were comprised of colleagues of uh, work of, of people from here at the uh, central office, as well as individuals from each of our schools and our support staff. They began work on May 28th. Within the, the two weeks that they worked together, there was over 500 hours of collaborative efforts that came together. These five groups, as Ms. McGraw mentioned earlier, um, were the health and safety operations, our instructional uh, uh, divided into three groups, high school, middle, and elementary school. Uh, we did send out a re to our staff on June 3rd, uh, and then our community staff community surveys went out on June 23rd. Next slide, please. So what we're going to do is review some of the responses for from the staff survey so that you all can see collectively uh, what those responses were. Uh, the, st the survey had uh, over 3000 respondents on the staff side. 57% or so were teachers, 12% IAs, and then on the slides you can see 
the breakdown of the other employee groups that, that responded to the survey. Next slide. This slide shows what our staff members comfort level is in returning to school or their work site in the fall. And you can see about 68% of the respondents indicated they were either comfortable or somewhat comfortable with returning to their workplace. Next slide, Mr. Stoddard. As we can see from this slide, uh, roughly 71.67% uh, of our staff uh, was willing to return to school utilizing some type of combined distance learning or uh, resuming normal operations. About 30% of our continue distance learning only. Um, so we keep this in mind as we move forward of what our overall staff, um, what our overall staff results were when asked. Next slide, please. I think it's important that our staff understands um, when we did take this, when we sent the survey out, we wanted to gauge where we stood, um, where our staff stood on different strategies uh, that we needed to put into place uh, to make them feel as safe as we possibly could. Uh, when we look at the results of this, what it tells us is social distancing um, and hygiene and sanitation are the top two concerns that we that our staff returned with. Mask wear was at about at 60%, about 67%, uh, and then temperature checks and uh, of students and visitors was at uh, 71%. Now, class sizes was only at about 18.8%. So this is very telling on the things that uh, you as our staff members relayed to us as uh, we begin to make this uh, our plans and our recommendations for when schools do reopen of what we need to be looking at. Next slide, please. And interestingly enough, those top three items that the staff pointed out as most important aligned very well with what the parents uh, pointed out as most important, and that'll be in the evening town hall. So I'd like to go over a couple of the options that we're looking at as far as instruction goes. So what we'd like to propose uh, is that parents would choose distance learning or an in-person instructional model. If the parent or family chose distance learning, uh, they would see that we are going to use interactive platforms that we've used previously. Uh, but different from in the spring, we're gonna require that there is more synchronous online instruction. We wanna make sure there's more online instruction that is giving direct engagement to our students. We're gonna ask families to register for an entire grading period. And we'll start that registration in late July or early August so that we can anticipate staffing needs based on the number of students, families who choose to uh, learn online versus those who would choose to come for in-person instruction. Next slide, please. The in-person option is going to uh, offer also some flexibility for families. So if students do not register for virtual, they'll be assigned the in-person option at their home school. Most of our students assigned to in-person instruction would receive two days a week of in-person instruction. The other days would be online or virtual learning. Some of our students, and this is getting back to that equity focus that we had in the guiding principles, and some of the examples of those students might be special education, English learners, free and reduced meal students, Students without internet uh, are earliest learners, may be offered more than two days of in-person instruction each week. Uh, safeguards will be in place at every level because we saw that those are important to our staff as well as our families. And we need to remember, this is a caveat for every single slide that we go over, our plans are flexible and include room for change if safeguards have to be reduced or increased and this model would uh, allow us to return to tra traditional school as long as health and safety uh, factors con uh, continue to move in the right direction. Uh, and we will be in touch with our local health department and safety folks to help guide us in those decisions. Next slide, please. So as we begin to uh, look at the results, uh, some of the things that the committees have recommended. Uh, so we'll start with health screening. Uh, please keep in mind that as we look at pre-screening questions, it's always evolving as more is learned from the scientific level about COVID-19. Uh, the CDC no longer sees temperature checks as a standalone symptom uh, for COVID-19. 
And as, as time continues and more is learned about this disease, we will see that pre-screening will change. Pre the pre-screening questions have changed. The pre-screening process has changed several times um, over the last 16 weeks. We have uh, been out of school. So what we have done as far as health screenings for our students, uh, we are partnering with the health department to purchase roughly 53,000 thermometers that will be able that parents will be able to obtain for their students that they can assist us in pre-screening at home. Uh, pre-screening of our children is a whole community effort and we wish to engage our community to ensure that they understand the importance of not sending ill students to school. As it relates to our employees, we, we have uh, developed a pre-screening tool for our employees that they will get on their computer when they log in in the morning. It'll ask you a number of questions, but at the same time, we are also asking and that if you are feeling ill, that you do not come to work. The next thing down is the contractors. Contractors uh, will be screened utilizing our scholarship, uh, our scholarship machine. Um, there is a, there will be a scholar, there will be a pre-screening selection of question and answers that they have to uh, complete prior to being able to come into the building. The next thing on the slide talks about masks and face coverings. This has been a, a, a hot topic in, in the world as we continue to discuss this, and we understand and know the mask can reduce the risk of transmission uh, when worn when social distancing isn't practical. With that in mind, our expectation is that students will wear their mask when it's practical, um, but it's distancing standards are impossible. Additionally, we look at the uh, students with uh, developmentally appropriate to wear masks. We also want to make sure that everyone understands that masks will be mandatory on school buses during class transitions and when social distancing is not possible. Next slide, please. Some additional uh, safeguards that we're putting in place. We're going to move all desks. So the recommendation is to move all desks so that they're six feet apart. There will be no communal gatherings. Uh, so lunch will be served in the classrooms. Recess uh, will be held, will be allowed. Um, parents with parents permission, parents can opt in or opt out of recess. I apologize um, if they feel as though their it is unsafe for their children to participate in recess. The developmental process of recess um, is very, very high, especially in the elementary schools. So we want to make sure that the children have that option. Class schedules will be changed uh, so that we're reducing as much of the class transition as possible. We have at, we're going to ask our administrators to move the, uh, to move lockers around so that social distancing will take place. Uh, as where kids are utilizing their lockers. We're going to use uh, additional entrance ways for arrival and dismissal, as well as we're going to, uh, at this point, not allow visitors, volunteer, or visitors or volunteers, and we're also going to not allow field trips, at least for now, for the first quarter, as we be begin to work through this process in our, in our recommendations. Next slide, please. Hand sanitizer and uh, hand wipes or wipes will be will be given to each classroom. We have been working on that for quite some time over the last 130 some days. We've been working on making sure that we can secure as many of our supplies as we possibly can. We've also uh, enlisted the help of our wonderful building services workers to ensure that we continue with our frequent touch point cleaning as well as our enhanced cleaning of our school buildings at the end of the day and throughout the school day, as well as the use of antiviral fogging when it is necessary or needed. We continue to work on uh, allowing and exploring ways to increase ambient airflow throughout our school system, throughout our schools. That may mean opening more windows if it is safe to do so. So we're looking for that balance of safety as well as increasing airflow, natural airflow throughout. We're encouraging students and staff to make sure that they bring their refillable water containers. Our water fountains will be in use. They will be allowed to refill water bottles and to utilize. However, uh, we encourage you to bring your own refillable containers. Next slide, please. Moving on, this is a cultural change that we are proposing for the Charles County Public Schools. As we know, many of our staff, as, as well as us, are very concerned with students who come to school ill for one reason or another. What we are going to do this year is in, in instituting this cultural change uh, is where if a student uh, does become ill at school, they will be isolated in, a, in, a, in an isolation room designated in the school. Um, we will then contact the parents and the expectation is that the parents will be able, must pick up their child within one hour of being notified. We're also going to ask uh, and we're going to re revamp the emergency contact card and increase the number of emergency contacts from what it currently sits at, I believe is three to as many as 10. 
that we have enough people that we can contact to come pick up sick children. In cases where we have a student or a staff member that tests positive for COVID, if we are informed of that, it is uh, important that you understand that there is no requirement for the health department or anyone to share data with a school system anywhere in the country that someone has tested positive that has been inside of the school building. However, if we are told or if we do find out, we will investigate each of those cases individually and working with our partners at the health department, um, working with our school administrators and my and our office, we will come up with the best possible plan that we can following the guidelines of, of all of our community partners. Next slide, please. Another area of strong concern with inside of our community is how we're going to transport students uh, to school. This is another cultural change uh, for the way that we're going to operate moving forward uh, or the way that we're proposing that we operate moving forward. Um, we are going to place our plan is to place one student per seat unless they live unless the students cohabitate or live together. Everyone remind, as a reminder will be wearing a mask. We are also going to ask parents to register for riding of the school bus every quarter so that we can make sure that we're utilizing and maximizing and being as efficient and effective as we can with our bus transportation. In addition, we're going to encourage our, our parents to transport their children or to make arrangements so that your children can be transported to and from school without using the school buses to lessen the burden. The school buses will be cleaned at least twice per day um, and utilizing all of these ideas, we're making the impossible possible moving forward to get as many children utilizing the school buses to school as we possibly can. Next slide. So let's talk about about you as teachers and staff members here in Charles County Public Schools. Um, you have adapted in an amazing way over the last 15 weeks and we thank you for that. We appreciate the agility that you've shown and the ability to still reach out to students and connect them to learning. Uh, but we understand and we recognize that there's a need for more training. Uh, the virtual instruction that we did last spring was good, but it wasn't great. It, we really need to work on continued training for helping our teachers learn how to teach online, learn how to engage students online. So we'll continue to provide that training to you uh, and to all of our staff members. We've already enhanced our safe schools training to add some modules there to make sure that you feel prepared and knowledgeable about the, the conditions you're going to be facing at school. Uh, this virtual town hall style training, um, what we're proposing is that you help us with coming up with uh, topics that you would like to engage with regarding COVID, regarding teaching, regarding health and safety in, in this new uh, world that we're living in. So we envision these to be maybe once a week, maybe twice a month, uh, kind of an optional uh, question and answer type of town hall session with staff members who choose to engage. Um, topics might include something like, um, how do I make sure my mask is clean and sanitized? Um, how do I use these online tools with different grade levels? How do I provide mental health supports for my staff as for my team, as well as for my students? So these are kind of um, generated from you topics that you feel like you'd like to know a little bit more about, and they'd be a little more free flowing. There'd be questions and answers rather than people just talking at you. Uh, we want them to be uh, kind of growing from your interests and your needs. And so that, that will be another way we'll try to add to your professional development. And then finally, social and emotional support. Uh, we know that everyone who has gone through the last 15 weeks in this country um, has been upset and our world has been rocked. And we wanna make sure that our staff, our adults uh, feel that they're on solid ground and they also feel as though they know how to help our students feel as though they're on solid ground. Uh, because when we think about those students who really rely upon school to stay connected, to stay safe, to be well fed, we know that those students are gonna have additional needs when they return to school. And we know that's gonna place a, an additional responsibility on our adults because we know the commitment that you have for children. 
So those are some, some of the plans that we have for professional development. Um, next slide, please. Uh, something that, that we want to make sure that all of you know as we're moving forward is that you should plan to resume your work activities as outlined in your contract. So school districts have 10 month employees, 10 and a half, 11 and 12 month employees, and all of you have a start date. We want you to be ready to go to work on that start date. We want you to know that we know that about 20% of you responded in our staff survey that you may have some issues with childcare. About 20% of you indicated that in the survey. And we've asked your supervisors, your principals, and your, your uh, immediate managers to work with you on your child care concerns as much as we can. Uh, we know that some of you may have questions about living with a relative who is in a high risk category. And we want you to have those questions answered. So the way that you do that is that you use the phone number that's on the screen. 301-934-7255 and contact one of our human resources folks who have been uh, trained in the new FMLA practices and will be able to help you answer the questions that you have regarding your own specific situation. Uh, Mr. Stoddart went over the sharing of information related to confirmed COVID and we would also remind you that as a staff member, you would be expected to self-report positive test results for yourself or for a family member that you are regularly exposed to. Next slide, please. Finally, um, we are gonna move forward and we're gonna move forward in a way that makes sense for you as well as for our students and our community. Please remember that the plans that we make must be aligned with any plans made by the governor and the State Department of Education. Uh, we're going to stay in constant contact with our local health officials and we'll have to adjust plans as those guardrails change for us. We understand that you want decisions. You want to know what is the fall going to look like and what is your world going to look like on August 24th when 10 month employees report back to work. And we're going to tell you that we're going to communicate with you as often as we can to make sure that you know everything that we know in a timely manner. And then finally, uh, we want you to know that we want our children back in school. That's how children learn best, when they're able to engage with you and interact with you and engage and interact with each other also. Uh, that's the goal, get kids back in school as soon as is safely possible. So uh, Ms. Wilson, I'd like to turn it over to you and uh, have you outline the rules for the public forum, and then we'll listen attentively as our staff members share their thoughts. Ms. Wilson, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Okay. Well, good evening. Thank you for attending the Board of Education and Charles County Public Schools Town Hall meeting to accept staff comment on the reopening of schools. I am Tim Wilson, Vice Chairman of the Board, and I will be conducting this evening's Town Hall. To ensure everyone has an opportunity to speak, there are a few rules. This afternoon, the Board is limiting the discussion to employee suggestions for reopening schools in the fall. Speakers will listen for their name to be called, and staff will unmute you. Speakers will have two minutes to speak. We ask that you keep your comments brief, so that everyone has a chance to participate. I encourage you to listen to what is discussed and to ask questions or contribute a different opinion if you have one. If the conversation is going too long, staff might ask you to wrap up your comments. Speakers should identify themselves by name only. Board members and the superintendent are here to listen to your comments and suggestions. So let's begin. We will now call our first speaker. Linda McLaughlin. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Linda McLaughlin. I'm the president of the Education Association of Charles County. I'd like to express my appreciation first for the diligence with which CCPS has approached the reopening task 
It has an incredible number of moving parts. Um, EACC has collaborated with CCPS during this whole process, and we had representatives on each of the five work groups. Now, secondly, all miss school, educators miss their students, students miss their schools, but we have to be safe. 57% of educators are in the danger zone age-wise. And just like we have to protect our students, we also have to protect our education professionals as well. The EACC is concerned with preserving educator jobs, not adding additional unfair workload and limiting the impact of the situation. There need to be alternatives and options based on clear expectations. And here are some concerns and considerations that I have heard. Um, if a teacher is immunocompromised and those are documented conditions with a physician, what are the alternative methods for them to meet their job responsibilities and fulfill their assignments? Um, electives, PE, sports, fine arts, and performing arts classes are the reasons why some students come and stay in school. We need to remember we are educating the whole child and staff should be able to work meaningfully in their areas of expertise when we start back. Pre-K and kindergarten students learn how to share and socialize in addition to academics. CDC guidelines for reopening schools state that the sharing of books, toys, and other learning aids should be limited and disinfected between users. I'm concerned about the long-term impact on students who are not allowed to or are not taught properly to share. Um, I'm worried about hand washing and hygiene. What about the classrooms and trailers that do not have running water? There needs to be training for students and parents on teams. Training the teachers is great, but if students cannot move within the team's program and their parents can't help them, it's all it's like the common core math all over again. People will get frustrated and no education will take place. Mr. McLaughlin, that's your two minutes. Can you wrap up, please? I can. Um, the last thing I was going to say, my last bullet point was child care concerns, and you've already sort of addressed those, but please keep those in mind. Thank you so much for the consistent collaboration that we have had, and I will be sending you more concerns. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Alyssa Engel. Ms. Engel? Is Ms. Engel on the line? Ms. Engel? We'll move on to Ashley Dunlap. Ms. Dunlap? I'll move to Betty Ajushi. Ms. Wilson, give me a minute to check in the other room to see if we're having a problem. Okay, we'll pause. Thank you. Okay, I'm informed that they did not join the conference. The next speaker is Danette Redman. I ain't saying nothing. They said Miss Danette Redman. I ain't saying nothing. Go ahead. Ms. Ms. Redman, Redman, can you proceed? No. I said my point already. I wrote it down. Ms. Redman, are you on the line? Let's move to the next speaker, Jamie Dunn. Hi, I'm Jamie Dunn. Thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, today. And I just wanted to address, obviously, a couple concerns I have. Um, 
some being mainly in the special needs community, um, thinking of IEP based um, thoughts, and that would be children that have prompting written in their IEPs. And a lot of this is, you know, physical prompting, modeling, stuff that requires hands on with the children that you cannot do within a six foot distance. So with that being said, you know, are staff going to be trained on this? And if it comes down to that federal document, you know, we have to uphold it. Is that considered um, non-compliance for us if we're not providing that physical prompting for the child um, due to the, you know, the limitations that are set forth in the classroom? So that leads me into my other point I have as far as um, children are in a crisis situation and whether or not they have a mask on or they don't um, if I have a mask on and you know the child begins to bite and begins to spit you know COVID can be transmitted through eye secretions um, it has been doctor documented by Dr. Fauci um, so you know that puts us at risk there too if not only are we considered to be wearing masks should of face shields as well um, when working with special needs children. Um, also, too, if they are required to wear a mask, um, what happens if the mask becomes soiled? You know, some of our children cannot feed themselves. They cannot toilet themselves. So, you know, again, that's stuff that we cannot do from a distance that really needs to be considered and talked about different ways to implement that because we can't fulfill the needs of the IEP if we're not hands-on with our special needs community. So going back to the mask, if they do soil the mask, can we make it guidelines with parents that they do, you know, need to store a mask at school just like they store clothing, you know, in that so that we have a backup plan? Or if you guys are providing us PPE equipment, <laughs> Is that something that we can have back up for the children in our classroom as well? You know, in order to your two minutes is up. Okay. Thank you for the time to speak. I appreciate all of you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Walsh. Hello, this is Jennifer Walsh. I am a speech pathologist and a team leader for special education teachers. I have two comments. Uh, my first comments related to the importance of being able to effectively instruct our students using masks. Um, as a speech pathologist, our students do rely on the use of nonverbal cues. Um, those students who have articulation disorders and delays need to be able to see our mouths in order to learn how we produce sounds. Um, as well as being able to effectively give feedback. We use many other cues other than verbal cues, such as tactile, touching the students, also um, visual cues. And then I also have concerns with those students who have language disorders and hearing impairments, being able to depend on that visual, not only from us, but from the classroom teachers. Um, if the required thing is for us to wear masks, my suggestion would be to have a mask with a clear window for both students and staff members. Um, I also feel that the use of plexiglass dividers when doing in-person speech therapy um, in the event that we were unable to wear the mask um, with windows would not be possible. Um, my other comment related to that actually Ms. Dunn just talked about and that was for our students in regionalized programs when um, the issues with them wearing the mask as well. My second comment um, is related to that of equity both for staff and students. As for staff during distance learning, um, those who provided special education services worked above and beyond many staff members in our community. They were required to create, not only deliver the specialized instruction, but to create it themselves to each of their students across multiple grade levels. I can only speak to this at the elementary level, but the documentation alone was overwhelming for so many of us. I work closely with two special educators and regionalized programs where they taught the curriculum to several students who all have different ways of learning in several grade levels. The parents had to learn all the strategies that work for their child overnight, and most of these students need in-person teaching because of their individual needs. I would like to publicly commend them for their efforts during distance learning. I saw firsthand the amount of work that went into being able to most effectively deliver this instruction virtually to those students. If distance learning is continued, I would like to see how Charles County Public Schools would make the way instruction is delivered 
and create it to be more equitable across all disciplines. I would Ms. like to have Walsh, two minutes is up. Can you wrap up, please? Yes, I can. Regarding work completion, communication with parents, and consistent guidance for IEP progress documentation. Thank you all for listening. Our next speaker is Lee Wetzel. Ms. Wetzel, you can proceed. As to how students and parents about grades throughout the district serve for them time passed in both Microsoft and actuality, they might either very misleading. We can't hear Ms. Witzel. Could you could you speak up, Ms. Ms. Witzel? The next topic, um, in addition to holding the students accountable, I think teachers have as far as providing feedback in a time equal grades in. Sort of leads me to the that occurred. Or I can't hear anything. Ms. Wetzel, can you turn your, your sound up on your computer or perhaps get closer to your microphone? Ms. Wetzel, we'll come back to you. Um, so uh, keep listening and we'll call your name again. Um, perhaps you can take a look at your computer and see if we can figure out how we can hear you better. Our next speaker is Lori Tennyson. Hello. I'm having a hard time Hello. hearing. I'm even having a hard time hearing like the last speaker or anything. I, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am a retired special education instructional assistant and I have, I am a substitute with the school system. I also have custody and guardianship of four children in the school system that are six, eight, 10, and nearly 13. Uh, so I had a, a have several concerns. Two of them have IEPs and one has a 504 and of course one's going into first grade. Um, I, I haven't heard anything and I missed a couple minutes of the presentation earlier, but what is your plan for substitutes? I have concerns about what the plan is for substitutes during this process and if there's going to be some additional training for um, substitutes in the school. And, and for the special education students and the distractions. Now, I heard you present about the um, split, having the option to do distance learning at home or days at school, but what is the plan for families that have four or five children? Will they, will you be working with the families to try to have all the kids on the same days or are they going to be split up? And I also wanted to know, would, would there be options possibly for some of the students, um, the special education students that have the IEPs for any kind of um, I, I listened to all the things and I really hadn't presented prepared much because I didn't get notification until a little while ago that I was going to be able to speak. So, pardon me, um, for some of the teachers to possibly um, do any home visits of any kind, probably not. Ms. Tennyson, your two minutes is up. Can okay, you wrap up, you. please? Uh, Our next speaker is Lorraine Lucier Hall. Mm -hmm. 
she's unmuted. on the line. Right. Lorraine Lucier Hall. Okay, I'll move on to the next. I'll move on to the next speaker, Michelle Fryer Dommel. Hello, my name is Michelle Fryer Dommel, and I want to thank you very much for allowing me to add some comment to the discussion. Um, I am an elementary science teacher, and um, as such, we have a unique teaching schedule as well as unique. Um, to teaching environment as well. Um, currently in the teaching schedule for elementary science, uh, for instance, for me, we meet once per week. So I'm concerned about having students in school for a couple of days a week and when would I have face-to-face -face time with them. The other part of that is if I have face-to-face um, -face time with some children, but I'm at school, I'm not sure how I could also provide virtual instruction. And I guess that's kind of a comment for really all teachers. You can't be doing two things at once, I suppose. So that's one thing. The other thing is the actual physical environment. Um, I have, as probably most science classrooms do, lab tables which does not um, really lend itself to social distancing these students in any way, shape, or form. They can't be six feet apart. Um, there's multiple students at a table. Even if you know we do some sort of alternating schedule where only part of the kids are in, um, even just sitting one child at a table, it would still be a tight fit in terms of social distancing. And I'm also concerned about the lab equipment and the materials. Every week in class, we do hands-on activities. And some of that can't necessarily be sanitized. It's soft materials, it's sand, it's dirt, it's other things, most of which probably can't really carry COVID. But, you know, I don't know. Um, so there's concerns about that as well. So those are some of the things that I wanted to just bring forward from um, the science perspective. I appreciate you letting me um, jump into the conversation and I thank you for everything that you're talking about today. Our next speaker is Nick Gardner. Good evening, my name is Nicholas Gardner. First, I'd like to thank the Board of Education, Dr. Hill and her staff for all you've done over the past three months to make distance learning possible for teachers and students. No system is perfect, but the combination of activities and a platform like Teams to connect with students is, in my view, a great start as we continue to navigate uncharted waters. I'm hopeful that we can build our distance learning program and make it even stronger since it appears we'll be using it for at least part of next year. I know also that we appreciated the almost weekly updates we received as everything happened over the past three months. We as teachers are planners and we work best when we have an idea of what to expect. Though I know, as you said, Dr. Hill, that we all hear much of the information from the state at the same time, please do continue to update us as soon as you can when decisions are made. This will help alleviate the anxiety that many of us have been feeling. I also greatly appreciate all of the time that everyone took to create the presentation today. Much thought has gone into what school will look like in the fall, and I'm certain that the state and our district will make decisions that are in the best interest of student and staff safety. As far as reopening schools in the fall, I believe that children belong in schools as quickly and safely as possible. While I would personally fully support schools opening like normal, I know that may well not be possible. Since it appears students will be in school at least a few days a week, my concerns are the additional safety measures that teachers and staff members will be asked to implement and hold students accountable for moving forward. Will instruction suffer with new safety measures in place? How will students be held accountable for complying with the new safety measures such as social distancing and student wearing of masks? What role will teachers play in things like taking student temperatures daily? Is having students in school two days a week with these measures in place better or worse than a full distance learning program? 
How would the distance learning and in-person instruction be, days be structured for students? I don't know that we have the answers to these questions yet, and I'm certain that those in charge and on the committee are working to answer them. I also know I speak for many teachers when I say that we're ready to give the students of Charles County our all, no matter what it looks like. I appreciate the tireless efforts of those working to make sure that we reopen safely and quickly. I believe we're in good hands. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speech speaker is Rachel Clark. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so I want to echo the same thing other folks said about thanking you all for um, how you handled the sudden closure of schools. Um, I'm really, really impressed with it. Um, and I don't think it could have gone any better than it did under the circumstances. Um, I'm a high school teacher. So any of my comments in addressing instruction of students relate only to experience with high schoolers, not to elementary. Um, all I ask is, as you continue to make plans for the fall, just keep in mind the following concerns. Um, if any one of us teachers were to be ill, we'd be home sick for a minimum of 14 days, more than likely longer than that. Um, we're only allotted 10 sick days and two personal days a year, and 12 days isn't even enough for us if we had to self-quarantine because we were exposed by a family member or a friend. Um, are you prepared to give us more than 12 days of leave in the event we catch the virus or have to quarantine? Or should we be expected to forego pay for any days past whatever leave we have? While this may not be an issue for veteran teachers who have compiled leave over the years, first year teachers only get the 12 days to start with. Um, if we do come down sick, we'll need a substitute for what appears to be at least a few days a week. Um, we have a sub shortage now, so I only imagine this will be worse under our current situation. Will we as a staff be expected to cover classes of our sick coworkers, further wearing us down and making us more at risk for illness ourselves? Um, I am also concerned to hear that parents may be allowed to choose whether or not their child attends school in person based on what they deem is safe, but it doesn't appear that teachers will be allowed to do the same. Um, many of us are at an at-risk population, whether it be due to age, overall health, or pre-existing conditions. If teachers are not comfortable returning to school due to concerns for our health, shouldn't we be given the same courtesy to choose how we offer education? Um, my comments don't come from a place of selfishness, but rather a place of preparedness and realism. As a biology teacher with a background in biosecurity and biodefense, I know the pandemic is far from over and that it will be very difficult for me to follow these guidelines and still give students the hands-on experience they need in the science classroom. Um, student safety and education is always paramount, but teachers can only provide them a quality education if we also feel safe and can stay healthy to perform the duties of our job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Eicholtz. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Eicholtz and I'm a middle school teacher. First, thank you for providing us this opportunity to speak out this evening. Um, I have four reasons why I believe we should not return to in-person instruction this fall. These include health and safety of coworkers, students, families, and communities. What were to happen if a staff member or student became ill? How will classes or schoolwork be handled when a student or teacher is out for two weeks due to self-quarantine? The ability to effectively monitor student work while maintaining appropriate social distancing and overall student discipline. I will elaborate on student discipline. It is no secret that we have discipline issues in our schools and that our discipline plans are based around multiple chances and interventions. We are dealing with a pandemic. We do not have time for chances and interventions when it comes to safety protocols that protect everyone inside and outside of the building. Nor do we have time to debate these protocols with students and families who feel otherwise. We are all operating on our own levels of risk, and I understand that. However, we cannot take into account other levels of risk than the ones set forth by CCPS. Whatever is decided, we need to be assured that students and parents and guardians will be held accountable for violations. Consequences should include immediate removal from the school building and removal from in-school instruction altogether if more than one violation has occurred. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Sandra Peterson Gomes. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak. I think my um, questions have been well articulated by the aforementioned speakers. 
Um, of course, as an employee, being concerned about being in that danger zone with employees and also um, staff members, and also the policy that will be taken for those who may not be able to integrate back into the school system because of being high risk, what um, options and alternatives are provided other than FMLA, which you don't get paid for. Um, also, I wanted to address um, students with disabilities and IEPs. I am hoping as we move forward that I know we did the best we could with the distance learning for those um, special population, but I'm also hoping that um, it could be more um, equity involved in the type of instruction that will be provided for these students because as an IEP facilitator, uh, many parents were languishing over how their, their children were not able to access the general education curriculum and actually um, seeing um, in person the impact of the disability on, on academic and instruction. Finally, my la last point was, um, again, following up what others have said regarding um, what happens when students, will PPP, PPE be offered to students at school? Will it be offered to employees, um, to families? What happens when um, people decide that they don't want to live within those confinements of social distancing? and um, wearing a mask and how they put others um, at at risk. And sec and the thirdly, my, my question surrounds what um, the if what impact will in any way have um, what, what impact will decisions have if and when the second wave um, hit. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shai Mashri. Gosh. Good afternoon, everybody. Am I audible? Can you yes. hear me? Thank you for yes. this opportunity. And I teach English at the secondary level. And I feel a phased re-entry of students uh, should be one of the things to consider for social distancing. That means bringing the elementary students first for quarter one rather than middle and high school so that the elementary kids can be spread over in element building as well as middle school because there will be more room to spread out in different buildings or keeping the student teacher ratio 10 or less. After I have uh, come up with my points after reading the Maryland together plan um, that was shared by MSDE and middle school and uh, secondary, they can at least for quarter one, that is the test drive period. Uh, they can continue with uh, the distance learning plan that we already started and they can uh, come back um, with a two day rotation, uh, if things look brighter over time and Fridays can be kept for teacher planning and PDs. And I would also suggest looping because, you know, with partial uh, time of kids coming to the building, looping and keeping the uh, same kids and the same teacher for uh, at least part of the school year, if not the full would be a plan for, uh, you know, uh, teacher effectiveness and familiarity with the same group of students and families uh, that will provide, you know, positive impact. And also if uh, if students, faculty or staff have immunocompromised health, they should be given the option of a substitute teacher in the classroom and the uh, regular teacher of record can do uh, can join the class uh, through distance learning where a substitute can the, can man the classroom physically with a doctor's note. Um, and, you know, also uh, me in my classroom, my classroom does not have any window for cross ventilation, light or fresh air. And that's that was a concern. But now with the pandemic, it's a worry, you know, coming together. So, re, you know, restricting uh, so changing um, classrooms will be one of the options, putting kids and teacher together in classrooms that has cross ventilation and windows for fresh air and light. Um, and not in classrooms that do not have that option. And also lunches in the classroom, as you already shared, restricting students from changing classrooms as much as possible, and rather keep the teachers rotating and change classrooms to avoid hallway traffic. Um, and the two minutes is up. Can you wrap up, please? Yes, uh, thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate this opportunity and all the brainstorm that is uh, storming that is going on. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Tara Walker is our next speaker. 
I don't have anything to say. Tracy Jennifer. Is Tara Walker on the phone? Tracy Jennifer. Tracy Jennifer. Yes, good afternoon. A lot that was said was concerns that I already had, but one of my biggest concerns is I'm an IA and I work with um, special needs children. And I have a concern about when we deal with potty, uh, potty issues as far as spreading of the germs, um, what precautions are going to be in place for that? And when children have sore clothes, you know, we normally just put them in a bag, what precautions are going to be taken you know, for that, as far as not spreading germs. And also my other concern is about employees with, um, cause this, um, you know, already have underlying conditions, what precautions or safety measures are gonna be put in place for them. Thank you. Tynesha Payton. Miss Payton, can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Okay, so my main question, um, as a, I'm, I'm a parent as well as um, a teacher here in Charles County, um, and my main concern um, would there be like some type of making sure that there is some type of consistency um, in regards to how instruction is given um, on all um, grade levels. Um, I guess that would be my main issue. And I want to thank you guys for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Valerie Bell. Um, I do have some concerns. A lot of them have already been addressed. Um, there are many things that we do know about COVID-19. So I wanted to focus on some of the things that we do know. Um, we know that some people are asymptomatic. Um, we know that being inside increases the risk. So um, just shifting gears really quick. Um, has there been like maybe a focus group of students who were in a classroom setting? Um, how did these students fare? Were they able to keep their mask on? Um, when they went to use the restroom, um, how do we really monitor if they're hand if they're washing their hands properly? And um, and what will be in place for students who will struggle, especially um, special needs students, with wearing that mask? Um, and then also just having staff all on one accord because um, everyone has an opinion on COVID. So some people feel, you know, they may not get it. Some people really don't want to wear a mask. <clears throat> just in general, just, you know, people have different thoughts and different feelings on, you know, the safety and, yeah, and everything else was addressed. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. We're going to go back to Ms. Wetzel. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. So I had asked sort of, um, how we were going to hold students accountable. Uh, I believe we need to give them some clear expectations and guidelines as to how their grade will be determined. Uh, had questions about grades throughout the distance learning for the and we had no answer for them except that students be assigned tasks and team and text. When it actual, they just needed to complete one task in either teams or Apex. Um, so I feel like we were very misleading, uh, which is against what I stand for as a teacher. Um, I really believe in being honest and transparent, and I think that that happened. Um, my next point is that. Uh, to hold the teachers accountable as well as far as providing feedback in a timely manner because I really think distance learning is going to work and feedback part of it. 
Um, this leads me to the elementary distance. Um, our county needs to come up with some alternative to paper packets. Uh, for eight weeks, students completed work on paper without any kind of feedback from their teachers. Um, feedback fosters learning, leads to deeper understanding and greater student achievement. Um, by transitioning to a digital curriculum, provide that feedback and assess students' understanding more in the moment tasks are completed. Uh, students can then use that feedback to gain a deep understanding um, or even a different perspective. There is no way that a young child can take an assignment on, say, a Monday, receive feedback a week later, and be able to apply it. Um, by that time, they've forgotten what they did in the first place. So at the elementary level, we need a curriculum for students that allows teachers to student and standing and provide thank you thank you miss wilson that was our last speaker okay thank you miss mcgraw Uh, that 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 concludes uh, the, the town hall. Uh, Ms. McGraw, do you have any further comments? No, I do not. Other than to say thank you very much for everyone that participated today, as well as staff members and the work that went into the presentations uh, for us as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that that concludes our town hall for staff.